so so I'm really looking forward to the discussions and the questions that will come after this, which is why I kept this uh, presentation deck fairly short. It's about a dozen slides only. I only wanted to introduce my evoc um, and uh, just one or two slides to talk about where we are today in Malaysia in terms of the EV ecosystem um, and a little bit of the user's perspectives uh, when uh, we talk to users or potential users in Malaysia over the past two or three years. Um, and the last part uh, is about uh, how do you get involved if you are interested. Okay, so what is my EVOC? It stands for Malaysian EV Owners Club and we are registered in May 2019. Um, we have about 190 paying members. These are, we have a private group, but we also have a public group that we have a chat group on. Telegram, about 200 plus members, and this is actually quite interesting because it, it has uh, people from the auto industry, not only the manufacturers, the regulators, the industry, uh, uh, supply chain people, as well as the media in there. And we sometimes uh, can get pretty heated in there when we talk about uh, stuff that's passionate to us. Another interesting thing I'd like to uh, also highlight is that we have pretty strong links with the Singapore EV community. It started out a number of years ago when we started our Facebook group and uh, some some very adventurous Singapore EV owners wanted to come up to Malaysia and started asking questions about where to charge, how do you get the charge EV cards and all that. So, so we sort of formed that friendship there and it has grown since. Um, so our purpose when we first set up the club is, is to represent the voice of the users and also to create awareness and the electric vehicle usage and to dispel some of the myths that we have. One popular one in Malaysia, I always point out is the fact that people are scared, oh, Malaysia, we have flash floods. When you drive EVs in there, won't you get electrocuted? So, so these kinds of <laughs> um, uh, myths we like to dispel and we have videos of our members driving through, fl driving through floods um, in Kuantan, in KL. So that's really not an issue. Okay, so today uh, in Malaysia, where are we? Uh, unfortunately, the data that's available uh, on the data.gov.my site is only as of May 2019. So we have only 194 battery electric vehicles, about 52,000 hybrid electric vehicles. Um, so we think that the numbers have increased to about four to 500 as of today. Um, although there's no real way to make sure, uh, to, to really be certain about that, seeing as JPJ doesn't release registration data anymore. As a matter of fact, they even deleted uh, the data that we have from May 2019. Uh, don't know why. Uh, so BEV registration peaked around 2014 and 2015, about six, seven years ago, uh, due to very favorable incentives. Uh, PHEV sales have been strong due to favorable incentives as well, but there are only four BEVs in the market today, uh, which are the Nissan Leaf, the Mini uh, Electric, the BMW i3s, and the Porsche Taycan. Um, we expect though, by next year, there will be more. Uh, we have been hearing many, many uh, OEMs from Hyundai, from Kia, from uh, MG, who are interested to start selling in Malaysia because also of the recent news that the government is more interested in giving incentives to help spur the growth of the market in Malaysia. So. Right now, though, there is a strong, strong demand for Model 3s, Tesla Model 3s for in Malaysia. They are grey imported. Uh, the, the importers bring them in from the UK and some from Hong Kong. Uh, we have cited some fairly exotic cars as well, Jaguar I-Pace, uh, Model X, uh, and I have a Model S myself. Um, so charging infrastructure, that's always a big question people have. We have about 500 uh, total charging stations in Malaysia with only with fewer than 12 actually rapid charging uh, DC stations. You need DC stations to actually uh, charge in sh a short time to help make your long trips uh, not so painful. Uh, the good news is that new charging operators, privately owned, are coming into the market. Uh, you may have seen the news recently, maybe about two, three months ago, that Shell Recharge has partnered with Porsche Asia Pacific to roll out some very high-speed chargers along the North South Highway. Uh, there's also some news articles covering EVC, EV connection, that's uh, already set up a bunch of DC chargers along the North South Highway. 
So just by going back to that slide, sorry, that took, so you said mm. the Model 3, um, are you bringing in, can people bring in used cars? Are these used, brand new, is it a mix? Uh, it's a mix. Uh, the, the unique thing about the EV grey imports is that uh, for ICE cars, you are not allowed to bring in brand new um, ICE models that are on sale in Malaysia for obvious reasons. But because a lot of these cars, there are no EVs other than those four models in the market, uh, the government allows uh, for new imports. So pretty much, actually all of the Tesla Model 3s that you see on the road in, uh, in Malaysia today were imported brand new. Okay. Okay. And so just jumping straight into the user's perspective, uh, I've been using an EV since 2017. We have a bunch of guys in the group as well that's been using EVs for just as long. Um, and uh, a variety of EVs, they have Zoe users, uh, i3 users, Leaf users. And so it's, it's interesting that to note that actually there are slight differences in perspectives, especially uh, between two and three, uh, the PHEV owners and the BEV owners. Uh, so the big differences are, are actually for the first group, actually, the guys who are currently ICE owners who are curious about EVs, the first thing they want to know is that where can I charge the damn thing? Uh, that's the first thing they want to know. So when I go out station, where do I charge? Will I be stranded? And so these are number one question. And before that question is answered, they won't even consider which EV they are going to go for. Now, range, point range that, uh, number anxiety, man. that's my biggest fear. Range exactly. Anxiety. Exactly. That's the number one uh, concern for, for those who have not yet experienced the EV life. Um, so group number two, though, is actually our people who actually are interested, who have bought the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. These are, these are PHEVs with very short range, usually with only about 20, 30. Nowadays, actually, they have models about 60, 70 kilometers. Mercedes is coming out with uh, PHEVs with a 100 kilometer range. Uh, so the number one thing, though, you hear from them is actually, I wish I had a bigger battery because I really love driving on electric once they get to it. Uh, and point number two that they always bring up is actually, I wish there's, there are more charging stations at places where I frequent, where I work, where I shop, where I relax. Um, so these are some of the things that they, they wish they had bigger range. They wish they can charge everywhere. Now, for BEV owners, uh, it's kind of similar, but most of the time the BEV owners are not so concerned about, oh, I wish I had a bigger battery because the batteries are usually quite big already. So it's more than enough for them to, once they can charge overnight, to use it daily with no issues of uh, running out in the middle of the day. Uh, but their concern is actually, what if I go outstation? Uh, mm -hmm. So what if I want to go to Penang? What if I want to go to JB? What if I want to go to Kuantan? Where do I charge? There are charging stations. Uh, uh, the Americans will call these fast charging stations because they're 22 kilowatts, but they're not fast enough. Uh, we want rapid charging stations, which are 50 kilowatts or faster that allows you to accumulate 200 or through 200 or 250 kilometers of range per hour of charging because they only want to stop for 15 to 20 minutes, which is enough for what I say a bio break or a snack. Uh, and then they want to keep going. Um, and so uh, that that is one of the one of the things that is, is brought up by BEP users. Where do I charge when I go outstation? So uh, going back to that slide, sorry, I got a question on the number two. So I, mm. I, I, my next vehicle, I've always thought would be a great hybrid. Mm. We, we go five kilometers, right? We go to the store and back to the school and back. So yep. it's parked and, and we don't take long trips that often. What is the plan? Do you know of any plans within Malaysia for, you know, the local car makers, Proton, Perdua, to start at least with a, a hybrid of some kind? Do you know of any plans? So far, the, the two bigger, uh, of course, the two biggest players are Proton and Produa. Uh, they have publicly come out to say that they are waiting for what the government is, uh, government policies are in terms of electric vehicles. And Produa themselves have specifically said that actually, yes, if there is an opportunity, we may start with hybrid. But it doesn't seem that they are interested so much in going the hybrid or the plug-in hybrid path. I think mostly because their main 
focus the market segment is the, the the smaller cars and those are very price sensitive so when you add a plug-in hybrid for example you have two drive trains and that not only drives up the initial cost of the vehicle it drives up the maintenance cost because now not only do you need to worry about the the, the electric drive train you need to worry about the normal oil changes the normal uh you know uh, air filters and, and all those things yeah, so it's an extra cost. The cars are a little more expensive. You got these big batteries yep. and uh, and all the infrastructure. Yeah, agreed. It does yep. double the cost at times. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So without clear government incentives to actually help uh, cover some of that cost for the consumer, they, I, and I agree with them, they just don't see their customers as being willing to fork out that much more for what a hybrid may mean like very slight fuel savings what more in malaysia actually that the petrol prices are controlled and being kept low by the government okay so that, that was a question actually i got a question in one of the chats given the high cost of these electric vehicles even the hybrids which which i love the hybrids as well given yep. the high cost in malaysia uh very few people can actually afford them do you see it as a as a limited market in malaysia uh, it is the the big push is actually not technology for technology's sake, right? Because we don't want to just go electric because we want to go electric. Even though I mean driving electric, once you experience it, you will love it. But essentially, the the the, the purpose that we are doing the the purpose what a lot of governments are pushing for electrification of land transport is because they want to reduce emissions from the land transportation sector now. In Malaysia, according to the latest uh, report from the Ministry of Environment, um, there are, uh, the, the transportation sector is the biggest uh, energy uh, consuming sector in Malaysia. The next is industry. Actually, I was quite surprised when I found that out. It's actually close to 27 or 28% of all energy consumed in Malaysia is consumed within the transportation sector. And energy means that actually it's all fossil fuels today. And that means that the emissions actually is is one of the biggest the biggest contributor of emissions in Malaysia is the transportation sector. Now, within the transportation sector itself, fifty eight percent comes from petrol passenger vehicles. So, in light even of the latest IPCC report, right, that says actually is unequivocal that we humans are the cause of the rise in global temperatures of 1.5 degrees celsius by 2040 um, which causes a lot of weird things happening with the weather so this is why actually governments everywhere are setting emissions targets are setting net zero targets we were familiar also with petronas setting their net zero targets by 2050 uh, that's why we need to do this that's why we need to reduce the emissions and this is why governments everywhere knowing that the cost of the technology to reduce emissions is higher than the existing technology are putting in place uh, action items such as subsidies, such as uh, uh, increasing the cost of the polluting technology. Norway is very good at that. They tax CO2 emissions, they tax, M they tax NO NOx emissions. And so that hopefully will make a clearer push for people to move gradually, not overnight because we also recognize the fact that look a car's useful life is between 5 to 10 to 15 years even and so we don't expect you to get rid of a perfectly functioning car uh, but we do governments everywhere would like consumers to consider their next car when their current car is due to be upgraded or due to be given to someone else uh, to be uh, emitting less emissions yeah I, All right. That, that I agree with. Yep. So, uh, so moving on, actually. So we were talking earlier about uh, the, the, the charging stations, uh, what we need. So uh, unfortunately, uh, because the focus of my EVOC and the EV movement is in Peninsular Malaysia today, I, haven't, uh, uh, I do have a map for Sarawak, don't have a map for Sabah. Uh, and I'm working with someone in Sarawak to actually just firm up what uh, is it's less of a charging corridor, but basically it's a charging corridor along the Pan Borneo Highway. But this is the picture that we, we see actually as a bare minimum for Peninsular Malaysia, what 
we think will be needed to just kickstart or catalyze the adoption of EVs, long-range EV simulation, so that people feel more comfortable. The good news is actually in Peninsular Malaysia, the driving distances are not that big. It's not like the US. It's not like uh, you know Australia, for example. It's a lot more like Europe and UK, where, for example, when you drive from KL to Penang, it's 350 kilometers, which is really, uh, for a modern EV, is just a single charge. So based on that, actually, that, that we, we sort of thought about it and, and, and figured out that actually at a minimum, you need about 10 locations along the corridor here, which is like KL to Kuantan, Kuantan up north to Kota Baru, across the east-west east highway to uh, Juru, Penang, coming down north-south highway KL again, and then Johor Baru, Desaru Beach, and along uh, the east coast of Johor and Pahang. So and is so, it, is it, you say private charging. Is it, it? Do you envision a partnership with like a bigger player, or is it just just independent people? Well, we look forward to all sorts of business models actually, because I think everywhere around the world you see the the more advanced market that you EU in Norway specifically, the Netherlands. Uh, they are they are like probably the most advanced markets for EVs in the world today. They're still trying out different models where, where for example, uh, you have uh, utilities partnering with uh, private charging operators, you have uh, uh, energy companies uh, or, or even oil companies like Shell, for example, spinning off uh, Shell Recharge and ac acquiring new motion. Uh, BP has acquired uh, yet another charging operator. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, flux still at the moment, uh, but then there's also an emerging trend where uh, the auto manufacturers see how successful Tesla is with their own supercharging network that is built uh, into the selling cars business that they also are looking at that. So we didn't think that would work, but now we see it's a genius idea. <laughs> and so, for example, just last week, uh, the Volkswagen chairman, Herbert, uh, Herbert Dees, uh, complained about the Ionity network when he was going on vacation uh, because he said, they're just not enough. I had to wait for this particular very popular spot. Uh, he was driving an ID3, which is admirable, by the way, uh, for, for the chairman of a, of a big car company to actually, you know, eat his own nasi lemak and use an EV for his private use. So yeah. he gets to understand. So he, he understood how actually important the charging infrastructure is. So there's utilities going into the business, there are uh, energy companies going to the business, and now the car manufacturers are starting to think like, hey, this is a good idea because if we don't have a good charging infrastructure, it's harder for us to sell cars. Um, so we think actually in Malaysia, it doesn't take that much. Um, one and a half to two million ringgit to actually kickstart this 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 uh, network across Malaysia, and as the number of EVs build up, it can be built up. Uh, it can be increased. So the important thing is to actually make sure the coverage is there. So one of the, the one other of the issue. Sorry, one of the ah, yes. in the chat was actually that that rural rural Malaysia. When when do you think rural Malaysia would get some type of infrastructure? And you're saying here you're kind of pinpointing 10 places around. Yeah. But uh, it's, it, how would rural Malaysia, um, yep. when do you think that would happen? Kind of. uh, I, I actually think that, well, okay, point number one is actually when we say EV infrastructure, pretty much EV infrastructure is everywhere, there's a three pin plug. That's true. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right here, yeah. I've got one here. Yeah, exactly. So, so every house really can. Uh, be charging an EV. Now the question is actually yes. Is it how how quickly do you want it to run? And I think that, that when we talk, yeah, when we talk about rural areas in Malaysia, specifically in Peninsular Malaysia, with this proposed national EV charging corridor, you'd cover probably about eighty to eighty five percent of the Peninsular Malaysia population, uh, and uh, uh, with the 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 adoption of more and more EVs, there could be more and more charging stations built, not necessarily by the federal government, not necessarily even by private charging operators, but by businesses. Because the idea is that that, that um, businesses will start seeing actually that their cafes, their restaurants, their shopping malls um, would need to have charging stations 
in order to attract more customers as more and more customers want to see, want to be able to charge their cars. Yeah, yeah. So for, know, for they're stuck for 20 minutes, you know, they're, they're there for 20 minutes, enough for a snack and a coffee, right? Yeah, or, or even a movie. I remember, for example, like watching a movie at one of the malls and I had to like, oh shit, my car's going to be fully charged before the movie is over, so I need to go and move it. So, <laughs> so these charges are not that slow and they're not very expensive to install. Okay. There is a, yep. another question on that, uh, that took this. There will be difficulty for those that live in an apartment or a condo as there's no charging points unless you spend your own money out of your pocket. And, and will you be allowed by JMB? That's one of the yep. questions. Maybe that's yeah. another model where if you set it up in your condo, you can rent it out to uh, other users or even people up the street. Yeah. So the, the challenge here is actually, and then this is not something, of course, unique to Malaysia, even like our neighbors in Singapore. I, 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 as I said before, we have pretty close relationship. I mean, a bunch of chat groups with them. And it is a problem, actually, because uh, these uh, uh, some of these uh, apartment buildings or condos were built back in the 70s or 80s. They weren't designed with enough electricity supply to the car parks to be able to uh, easily provide the power needed to charge an EV overnight even because it requires you know, extra wiring, it requires extra DB, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's also the mindset of the people who are managing it. Some of them are worried about, oh, what if there's a fire? What are the liabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in other regions, what we have seen are two or three things that are effective in terms of addressing this. And again, this is something that will take years, will take time, and it will gradually evolve into something that is a win-win for the apartment dwellers, the EV adoption, as well as the management of those. It's actually one rule. Uh, right to charge rule. Uh, essentially, the authorities are going to say something like, okay, you JMB, if you're, if you're saying that you can't provide uh, access to charging to your residents, you need to write to us in black and white as to why. So it's a show cause. It's not forcing you to do so, but this actually uh, would nudge the JMB from taking a, the easy way out, which is to say no first. Oh, yeah. Right? And so, so that's, that's a very effective uh, way to, to address this that we've seen elsewhere around the world. Number two, um, if that is not possible, uh, then, then you would want to actually create a situation where new apartment buildings have uh, at least catered for the wiring needed for the parking garages to actually have uh, capability to be, to, be, to be charging vehicles. Uh, those are for new uh, for new points, but for for these existing uh, uh, um, buildings and existing multi user uh, multi home dwellers. So, uh, one of the things that they are trying out in big cities such as New York, London, uh, as well as San Francisco, is to build these high speed charging parks, uh, where where they are situated. Uh, near an empty lot, quite near uh, the, these clusters of high-end or apartment buildings where the users can just go there, spend 10-15 minutes uh, plugging in. Hopefully, there's a coffee place nearby uh, and then that's enough to take them through a few days of use. Um, but as I said before, it's actually that these are not insurmountable problems. The technical solutions are there, uh, but there needs to be... Uh, uh, I guess the effort and the, the desire to actually go and solve them, but they are solvable. Uh, it's not an issue. And some governments even give grants uh, to help defray the costs of these modifications. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so one of the things, and one of the weird things we have in Malaysia though, is actually the, the road tax structure uh, for EVs. I, I've created here a slide where we compare the three different uh, variants of the Mini, and we can see actually the, the popular Mini Cooper S with a two liter four cylinder with corresponding, uh, with 141 kilowatts of power with 128 grams of, uh, uh, of per kilometer of tailpipe pipe emissions is 379 ringgit because of its two liter engine, it counts it by capacity, right? Okay. The, the plug-in hybrid version, which is actually uh, slightly more powerful, 165 kilowatts, uh, because it has the electric motor to supplement it, even lower emissions um, is 90 ringgit a year. So with higher power, lower emissions, lower road tax, 90 ringgit only. 
but we see the electric with zero emissions um, and uh, with with less power is charged 724 ringgit a year it's like double the the two liter so because it is calculated on the basis of motor power 135 kilowatt um so the the idea is actually that uh, it's, it's a bit weird because you have you know uh, and uh, pure ice that is measured on engine capacity you have uh, a hybrid with also which also has electric motor but it's still counted on engine capacity and then you have electric which is suddenly counted by motor power so uh, there there are conversations within the authorities to actually go and relook at this we just like to make sure that please relook at this and see what everywhere else uh, is doing actually uh, you guys may may have uh, noticed that the big trillion dollar infrastructure bill has just passed in the US uh, this is Biden's infrastructure plan which includes a big chunk for EV infrastructure as well as EV adoption and one of the lines in there actually is uh, uh, the law actually uh, the bill actually requires a proposal for a new way to impose what their version of road taxes which is actually they used to have a gasoline tax that is used to maintain highways so they are also looking at this problem they don't have an answer yet uh, governments in Australia, for example, in Victoria, the state is doing a uh, per kilometer uh, fee for their annual road tax. So these are some of the answers our, uh, people everywhere are looking at, and we need to do the same. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. And uh, so the summary of key takeaways, uh, I love using this picture because it has like the Malaysian flag, the sunset and a Porsche charging or not. It's unplugged right now. I think I took this picture <laughs> before I plugged it in because I didn't want to lose the sunset. And then usually I get flamed. Hey, Apala, you go and park there and don't charge. But uh, <laughs> I said, that's before I charge. I wanted to catch the sunset and the flag. Um, so the, the, the point here is actually that there are different types of charging infrastructure. Uh, don't lump it all into lack of infrastructure. I think we have a, uh, for residential charging, we are pretty good already. Other, the fact, other than the fact that there are some people who desire to have EVs but live in condos, that it's difficult for them to charge. Um, and workplace charging is something that we really need to work at in terms of, uh, because the car is going to be sitting there for seven, eight, nine, ten hours. It just doesn't make sense for us not to uh, encourage charging over there because once you have workplace charging, then the residential charging becomes less important. Yeah. Um, because because then, then remember also that that once you plug in your car at work for seven, eight, nine, ten hours, that's the this magical opportunity that opens to be uh, for the batteries in these cars to be used as some sort of uh, two-way storage by the utility to help with the grid management. And so those are also some of the models that are being explored in other parts of the world. Yeah, agreed. Like even uh, we're working with some other companies here in Malaysia where the building itself is trying to go green and put a lot of solar panels and thinking about uh, renewable energy associated with the building. So yep. then they're getting some of their energy off of the, the grid, which of course our grid in Malaysia, it's a lot of uh, natural gas, which is a yep. good thing, but some of it's coal as well. Yep. But uh, that's one of our questions here is like, what do you think? Is there things going hand in hand with getting our, our national grid here in Malaysia off of the fossil fuels or at least introducing more things like carbon capture and sequestration? so that we can actually be a lot greener with these EVs. Oh, definitely, definitely. And on that, actually, I have something in that we can show. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is a recent study by uh, Transport and Environment uh, about the, so they did like a, a superb study with the production of the EV, the battery production, the car production, but that, that the, the bottom line is the fact that even if you take the worst case scenario of a very dirty grid and a very dirty production, um, an EV still emits 22 less percent, uh, 22 percent less CO2 and 28 percent less than petrol uh, vehicles. Now, the thing I'd like to point out is actually this is the worst case, Poland being 750 grams per kilowatt hour of uh, CO2 intensity. Malaysia today is 700 grams. So 
even today at our not so clean grid where 92 percent i think is from fossil fuels natural gas and coal uh we are still better than petrol and diesel now emissions get low over time i totally agree we need to decarbonize our grid and the first place we should address is actually how do we burn less coal and and the big issue there is is two dimensions actually one dimension is because officially malaysia has a what is it, four fuel five fuel policy where where because of energy security the grid needs to be powered by diverse fuel sources we had uh you know, a bad experience, I think back 20 years ago when we were more reliant on natural gas and the natural gas supply uh, was disrupted uh, at, at a couple of points, actually. And we end up having to do extreme measures in order to keep the grid alive. And so then there's the policy to actually, there must be some coal, there must be some natural gas, there must be some renewables, hydro, and so on and so forth. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is, of course, burning coal is cheap. Uh, yeah. And, and that enables the government to give you, uh, to give the consumers actually the tariffs that we have been taught to expect, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, of course, doesn't take into account the externalities, the harm that burning coal is doing to the environment, not only to the environment, actually, to us indirectly, bringing, breathing in the particulates and breathing in the NOx and so on and so forth. So, yes, uh, the government has announced plans to increase the renewable generating capacity. However, disappointingly, the government has not uh, published uh, the, the current carbon intensity of the grid um, uh, on a regular basis so that we can keep track of what actually we are using. And I think also there's some, it's kind of misleading also to say that um, we have 40% or 25% of renewable energy capacity because the actual energy generator depends on the capacity factor, depends on the uh, how do you dispatch the power and so on and so forth. And then if you want, there's the grid operator website that actually tells you in real time what is being burned uh, in the Malaysian grid. And the picture is not pretty. Uh, we burn a lot of coal, over 50%. Uh, on a daily basis. Yeah, well, I think I think with the part of the a uh, lot of oil and gas guys in, in, in the call here today, we do have technology like carbon capture, where you can take your coal burning plants, you can take your natural gas plants, and you can yeah. re-inject re -inject that uh, emissions, those emissions. And if you're going to see a tremendous demand in electricity, which you're gonna, you're going to see a tremendous demand in electricity. Uh, we should really scale up those and introduce that injection to save. Uh, and, and, and Petronas knows this, Petronas is on top of this. But really, you know, if you think of the electricity demand going up here and, and, and the demand of, uh, for gasoline, especially for transportation, is going to go down, then there's an opportunity here to really do it right and, and be in a position, I hope, in, in 10 years. We can have this conversation again in 10 years and we'll see where we're at. Yeah. So uh, interestingly, when you talk about demand, one of the things that, that, that always comes up when we discuss is actually that we'll, we will not be able to support the extra uh, uh -huh. demand of EVs. And so I did this actually simulation uh, just based on actual data on the 12th May. This is what our generating profile looks like for Peninsular Malaysia. And I, I took an arbitrary line at 14,000 megawatts to just show, because I wanted to show us actually during the dip between 1 a.m. and 8.30 a.m., um, there's enough excess, well, excess energy there, meaning that actually that we don't have to, uh, we, we, we don't have to start at up any new plants of 7,400 uh, megawatt hours. And off the top of my head, when I calculated that, that's actually over 7,000 EVs today that can be plugged in uh, at night without any changes at all to the grid. Okay, it's a great plot. So it's, it's by hour, it's 24 hour period. And at night time, you know, there's no demand, but we still have the capacity to generate because I, I, I know you guys don't have much solar here, um, but uh, that's a brilliant chart 
to reflect that there's plenty of room in the infrastructure right now yep. for, uh, for EVs. Interesting yeah. part. Yeah. Interesting part. And, uh, and the other interesting bit is actually that uh, we know for a fact that both the utility, TNB, and the system, uh, the, the single buyer and the grid operator are actually taking active steps to update their modeling, their models to take into account uh, the increased demand from EVs. So uh, to their credit, actually, that they know that this is coming and to their cred incredible uh, foresight in terms of, okay, let's make sure that the grid will continue to be able to cope and let's model that in so that we know what to do, what to plan for uh, in order. So this actually, interestingly, we've been in conversations with uh, the authorities saying like, look, why don't you impose time of use uh, tariffs so that then EV yeah. users at home yeah. can charge their cars at night uh, at a cheaper rate uh, so that then we help soak up some of the excess capacity that you have and also help manage you, uh, help you manage the grid. Yeah, agreed. I, I really like this chart. It gives me an idea. This is where, you know, an analysis like this should be driving a bit government policy in a way. I got a, another question here from uh, one of the guys uh, listening. He says, what incentives do you think could be implemented in Malaysia to increase EV attractiveness compared to uh, other fuels? And I'm wondering if there's a program, you just said a number, 7,000 cars, EV mm -hmm. cars could be you know, supported on the infrastructure without any infrastructure costs, really. What mm -hmm. program or what do you think an incentive could be to get people off their ice? Well, usually the big, the big, uh, I guess, uh, impediment for people when they consider moving to an EV car is, of course, number one is that, where am I going to charge? And that one is actually where the government can actually play a role in incentivizing uh, public-private partnership or, or matching grants to for because we already have private operators, right? And so to encourage these private operators to take a little bit more risk and build the infrastructure ahead of demand. And so that's where the government can actually come in and provide a cushion to that risk via grants or via, I don't know, soft loans or whatever it is. Lah. So that's one part. The government can help ensure that the infrastructure is there. The other part is, of course, when, when people consider buying an EV, is that, oh, when I compare it with the equivalent ICE, it costs so much more. Yeah. And yeah. so that's what uh, a lot of countries do, uh, where, where they introduce this new clean vehicle grant where they give, like the US is giving $7,000, New Zealand is giving $7,000 as well. The UK has a range, the G Germany has a range, Norway has a range, and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, it helps defray some of the higher initial costs uh, via grants. In Malaysia, because our our cars actually have both excise tax and import tax, and, and for, for, for non-locally assembled cars, this can be quite a big proportion of the cost one of the things that we have proposed is actually to cut this to zero for EVs. That will help to bring the cost, cost down significantly. So that's the second part, the initial purchase part. The third part is actually more along the lines of how do you actually make it easier and nicer and cheaper for someone who already bought the EV to operate. So countries like Norway, the UK, the UK actually is very interesting. They introduced a green license plate. Uh, for, for EVs, for zero emission vehicles. And this green license plate allows you, for example, to drive through London without any congestion charge. That's right. It allow, That's right. I've yeah. seen that a few taxis have done that and uh, a few rich people as well have done that in London, <laughs> London to get a car that, that has no emissions. Yep. And so, so the green license plate is actually more like a key that then uh, over time you can either provide discounts for tolls, discount for parking, discount, whatever discount you want to give. And it doesn't have to be a permanent thing, right? Because you can just have programs that stretch. Okay. Uh, because we, we think that uh, we need to have more EV users here in this particular area, then you can give these sweetie, sweets or goodies to that particular area only if you have a green license plate. So these are some of the ideas. And the, the thing is actually that we don't have to like reinvent the wheel, right? Because all these things have been tried out. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. Uh, we can just like do our research and find out so actually like if they tried this, it worked kind of well, but there's this loophole. Okay, let's implement it without the loophole. 
So it's just like uh, you don't really have to spend a lot of brain power. Lah. I mean to say it's actually to come up with these incentives. You just take a look around and see what works uh, and retrofit it to Malaysia and monitor it to make sure there's no abuse, there's no loophole and adjust it along the way. Yeah, well, I think you, you mentioned it at the beginning. There's over 50,000 uh, hybrid EVs here. And yeah. yet, uh, I, I, I read a comment in the chats here that in 2012, the government had a 0% tax for hybrid. Yes. But then they took it away? Yeah. They took it away, huh? So it was just to yeah. serve people, but now they've taken it away. Because the hybrid vehicles are, are still yeah. expensive. Uh, they're, you know, they're a notch up, of course. Uh, they're all yeah. imports as well. But what do you think of bringing that back for hybrids? Oh, definitely. I think that uh, the idea then was good. Actually, in 2010, that was actually when those incentives were introduced. Um, the, the idea was that uh, very, very roughly, there was a big green energy master plan. And so the idea is actually whatever it is, we shall create the demand uh, users to actually start using more hybrid and electric vehicles, regardless of where they are built. Uh, it can be imported, it can okay. be locally manufactured. Sort of. So they wanted to create a critical mass so that then the accompanying infrastructure gets built as well. And by the infrastructure, we don't only mean the charging infrastructure, but also the after sales service, for example. Uh. Right? And so, so that was the idea so that then organically it will grow and then we will have an ecosystem. And over time, our local guys will start developing the skills. And one good example is actually because of the fact that locally assembled plug-in hybrid vehicles get those sweet incentives, not as sweet as before, but pretty sweet. That's why there's 50,000 uh, hybrid vehicles in Malaysia. Those numbers are enough to actually create a small, to start a cottage industry of third-party workshops that spe specializes in hybrid powertrains. Uh, I was so excited to learn that a few days ago, a, a workshop here in PJ is actually already starting to uh, offer services to repair individual modules on the BMW plug-in hybrid vehicles. So you don't have to, you know, as usual, get charged an arm and a leg if you go back to the manufacturer. Yeah, uh, you can go to a third-party workshop <laughs> and then and then instead of replacing the whole damn thing, they will say, let me open it up and see service which is service. actually the broken part. Yes, exactly. It's better for the environment anyway. Yeah, you're not, you're not throwing out uh, the big piece. There's a good yeah, and they're perfectly usable bits along with those. So, yeah. so I'm very happy to see that. And we can see how that organically grew because we, policy-wise, we didn't interfere with the way the market works. Okay. And unfortunately, back in 2014, there was a direction, so, oh, no, 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 we only want to give incentives for locally assembled hybrids and locally assembled uh, electric vehicles. And so that sort of like... Uh, yank the rug from all the guys who actually have been investing in the infrastructure and the after sales systems and so on. So, so we hope that when the government does do something this year or next year, hopefully, that there will be enough of a runway and don't interrupt it halfway. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully support that. I hope that happens next year as well. Another question, I got a good question here for you. At, at Aleka Talks, we had a, a debate uh, a few weeks back called the... Uh, the carrot or the stick. Mm. And, uh, it's an expression from North America, really. Do you incentivize yep. people or do you beat them with a stick, with a tax? And uh, one of the <laughs> questions is, you know, kind of the real incentive that we see around the world, certainly in developed nations, is uh, taxes on petrol. Yeah. So yeah. you're really not going to get there as a nation unless you really creep up the cost uh, of fueling an ice, uh, fueling an internal combustion engine. What are what are your thoughts? Could Malaysia sustain higher fuel prices? I think we could. It's just a matter of gradually implementing it. The thing is actually that because our whole economic system has been accreting around low cost, low cost of energy, low cost of labor, low cost of land, etc, etc. So, so it requires um, a, a, a very conscious effort to grow past that and because um, it is not something that could, could uh, be done overnight. It needs to be managed carefully because also like, look, for example, right, um, 
if you were to do something overnight, like we tried to do, I think back in 2008 or 2000, earlier during the, the, the one of the administrations where they just slashed a few subsidies, uh, it, it shocked the economic system such that it resulted in unwanted economic impact. So to, the short answer is I believe there is a path to first reduce subsidies, fuel subsidies, um, take a checkpoint once we get there, maybe in three, four, five years. And then there is also an opportunity for us to, uh, I wouldn't say tax fuel, but to price in the external costs of burning fossil fuels to the environment. And so to factor in those costs so that then we have money to actually go and fix the damage that was done before when we didn't factor in the cost of the damage being done to the environment. 